And this morning, I won't be preaching a how-to message on daily devotions. I just point you to a booklet that we've produced as a church, and there are copies of these available on our connections desk. If you don't know how to have a, have a devotional time where it leads you to the point of not just reading and understanding, but also doing the Word of God, I encourage you to have a read through that. And if you still need someone to come alongside you, there are plenty of people in this church who would love to be by your side in that journey of helping you discover God's Word in a brand new way, a very real way, a very practical way, a way that is contemporary for your life right now. And uh, we can help you through that process. Just let us know. I'd like some help in that, and we can arrange that for you. This morning, however, I want to explore on what's on God's mind when we commit ourselves to spending this time in His Word. What's God thinking about? What's God's agenda, if you like, when we come before Him? When we give him that time and when we say, God, you're not our number one focus right now, this time, this, this five minutes, this half hour, this hour, some of you, multiple hours, this is for you. This is for you, Lord God. What's on God's mind when we come before him? Because we are dealing with the most powerful force in all of existence, the word of God. It is the most powerful thing that you will ever come across. The entire creation, our world and everything in it, our universe and universes beyond it, all came about through the Word of God. John says it like this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, the Word that is, all things were made. Nothing, without Him, sorry, nothing has been made. Nothing was made that has been made in Him was life. God created the world by His Word. And when the world needed a Saviour, that Word became flesh. And His name was Jesus Christ. And He came into our world and died on a cross like that in our place. This this is an incredible symbol because at that cross, the Christ became the crucified. At that cross, criminals became children. And what I want to talk about a bit this morning is at that cross, condemnation became conviction. Amazing things happened at the cross of Christ. Jesus Christ was the incarnate Word of God. The most powerful event in all of history and will ever happen was the Word of God coming into our world and taking our place. So when God says we need to talk... (laughs) When he says we need to talk, he's talking about the most powerful and life-giving force in this universe. And if you need change, if you need resources, if you need understanding and encouragement, if you need to get a vision for your life or assurance about what you do not know, if you need healing or releasing or equipping, the Word of God is the answer to all of that. Whatever your need is, the Word will speak into it. It's a word that we all know from Genesis through to Revelation and yet it becomes as individual as you and I as we read it and as God applies it to our life. It's a timeless word. It's a word that had meaning for people that lived millennia ago and it's a word that has fresh meaning for us today. That's because it's a living word. Do you know God sends his word? Isaiah says this in Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God is sending his word. But here's the question, have you checked your letterbox lately? You see, we all check our letterboxes daily, don't we? We don't always like what we find in there, but generally we're checking them daily. I've seen some letterboxes, however, that look a bit more like whatever that next slide is, that one. I've seen some letterboxes like that. But God, it says, has sent a word for your nourishment, and I've just made up a word, for your flourishment. He sends a word for your good. He sends a word for your growth. He sends a word to do you good, not harm. He sends that word, but if we leave it in the letterbox, we may never know. We may never know. Don't leave it in the letterbox. Go daily. Check the message that God has sent for me today. 
It's right there in his word. Maybe we should call our Bibles the letterbox because right in there is a message for you every single day. And it's not a window envelope. It's not something where you end up thinking, I owe God. It's not like that. It's a message of hope and it's a message of promise. It's a message to do you good, not harm. And I can tell you for sure, it'll be a message that brings you more enjoyment than some other mail that you get. We need to talk. Have you ever had that said to you? Oh, no. I think you may have, Jackson. I think you may have. I think most of us have. You see, we need to talk is one of those phrases where it sort of bids doom and gloom, doesn't it? I was uh, reading something about a mother and she was getting sick and tired of her out-of-work son's habit of being home late every evening and under the weather and then sleeping in till mid-morning or middle of the day. So she wrote backwards on his forehead with a felt pen while he was sleeping, we need, we need to talk. We need to talk. Someone once said that in that one sentence we need to talk is the power to make you remember every single bad thing you ever did in your life. But is that the reaction that God's looking for when he says to us, we need to talk? Because some people have that idea of God. Some people think, well, if God wants to speak to me, it can only mean one thing. I've done something wrong. He's on my case. Some people think, you know, the lightning bolt is just waiting, you know, just waiting and uh, God, God says, we need to talk, I'm running for shelter. That's how some people think about God. It's like that, it's like that phrase that all of us parents of, all of us mothers, were all, not us mothers, but all, I'm getting confused now with Stuart's men's group. Uh, you know, when mums say, wait till your father gets home. Mate, I heard that a few times. My goodness me. But that's not what God means when he says we need to talk. It's not some sort of, sort of Damocles that's hanging over your head and when God says we need to talk, you know your head's coming off pretty quickly. It's not like that. God has something else in mind. And can I say that it's nice to think that God wants to talk to us? But this message is far more important than that. God needs to talk to you. He needs to. And we need to hear from him. I can find three chief things in Scripture that are on God's mind when he says we need to talk. I've given them all the words starting with C. Hopefully that'll help you to remember. But I've I've found, as I look look back through my devotions, I thought, well, is this right? Does this actually work out? So I look back through my devotions this year so far, and these three things are always coming up, always. And I think Scripture also supports that. They bring correction. They allay fears and they speak to me of his plans. When God says we need to talk, three things that are on his mind are conviction, concerns and calling. Conviction, concerns and calling. That's what's on God's mind when he says we need to talk. And they all have a purpose of causing you to flourish. It's important to remember that. They all have a purpose of causing you to flourish. Well, conviction. It's about talking with God together with him about the failings in our life. That's what conviction is about. And that's what, I'm, that's what I mean by it in this message. Those failings could be big, they could be small. But it's, I found it's always good to keep a short account of sin with God. So if you've got a daily devotional practice and God wants to send you a message of conviction, it means he just wants to keep a short account with you. Let's just get yesterday right. Let's just get this morning before we got into the word right. Let's, let's just keep it short. It's called conviction. It's not called condemnation. We need to understand that. At the cross, condemnation became conviction. Jesus took our condemnation. Jesus took that on our behalf. Now we are the children of God. We don't use that word anymore. We use the word conviction with a very, very different meaning. As I said last Sunday, we can celebrate each day as sons and daughters. Every new day we can celebrate because Romans 8, 1 says that therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a reason to party just in itself. What's remarkable about that verse is the context in which it's written. You see, that's written at the beginning of chapter 8, but chapter 7 finishes with Paul's struggle about not being able to do the good that he wants to do, but doing the bad that he doesn't want to do. 
There's this inner struggle going on in Paul. Uh, what I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. And what I, what I do want to do, pleasing God, I, I don't do it. But it, it leads him, because of conviction, not condemnation, it leads him to write almost straight away, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God for an awesome saviour who has changed condemnation into conviction. If you're struggling with sin and God says we need to talk, it's not to condemn you. It's to bring you to a better place. There is no condemnation for those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ, but there is conviction of sin and there needs to be. You see, condemnation has a focus on the past. It looks at what you did and it looks at the consequences because of what you did. But conviction doesn't. Conviction has its focus on the future. Conviction says, I'm going to take you to a better place. This is what you've done and that's not you. That's not who I've made you to be. I want to take you on to something better. Conviction always has good in mind. And even if you've just committed the worst sin in your life, God is searching you out and saying, we need to talk. It's what he did way back there in Genesis in the garden. Adam and Eve, the sin that infected an entire planet for all generations. The worst sin you could ever imagine. And God comes into the garden and they're hiding from him. But God's saying, we need to talk. And then and there, God doesn't overlook the sin. He pinpoints the sin. But there and then he declares that one day my son is coming who will not just pay for that sin, he will pay for the sins of the entire world. It was a word of conviction not condemnation. Conviction addresses the sin, but in the light of a better future. Isaiah once again said it this way, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. In other words, we need to talk. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. The prophet Isaiah speaking the word of God. And God is saying, it might be like that now because I've pinpointed it and you can see it and we're all aware of it and we're not overlooking it, but let let me tell you what's going to happen. It's not going to stay that way. Because of my son, Jesus Christ, your sins will be wiped away. It's the difference between condemnation and conviction. And conviction is a necessary topic of conversation for us with God because our sin will hold us back from all the promises that he's made over our life. Our sin will hold us back from the plans that we have, the plans that he has, rather, for us, plans that our lives should bring him glory. And last week I shared that verse from Romans about no more condemnation because I personally was convicted while we were singing this. We were singing the song Holy Spirit. Now, let me tell you, the week prior to last Sunday, that weekend all our young adults were going to be away. That weekend, there were chrysalis flights on that were going to take people away. That weekend was the middle weekend of holidays. And all week, I'm thinking, it's going to be an empty church. There's going to be gaps everywhere. Not going to be good. Going to get depressed. This is what I'm... Well, I didn't think the last one, but most of the rest of it, I did. Most of the rest of it, I did. And then I I, I happened to say, Julianne was our guest speaker last Sunday. Almost the first thing I said to Julianne was, don't expect a big crowd, Julianne. Big calls. Boom, 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 boom. And, and some other people, I, I said it too. And, and, and then I'm sitting in the front row, thinking about the gaps in the church, and we're singing, Holy Spirit, flood this space. And right then, God says, we need to talk. And he said to me, have you once thought about who is here? Whoa. You see, God's here. Two or three come together. Someone said it before. God is here. The creator of the universe is here and you're worried about who isn't here. But it wasn't condemnation. It was just conviction. And as I began to sing the rest of that song, by the end of the song, I'm smiling. This is awesome. God is here. What's he going to do? The presence of God through the Holy Spirit is right here in this place. What is he going to do? And I was expectant. And so by the last song, and I was doing the transition, and I turned around thinking I'd see just a bare handful of people, which is what I saw... By the way, what we see when we come in from prayer before the service is barely a handful of people most Sundays. Church is not the place to be fashionably late, just saying. But I thought, I thought just as I turn around, that's what I'm going to see. Yes, you're all clapping. 
That's wonderful. There'll be an altar call for that later too. All right. And I'm thinking I'm going to see a bare handful of people, and it was far more than I ever imagined. But it wasn't because of the people that I was happy. It was because of the presence of God. See, that's a word of conviction. It brings you to a better place. It looks at what you've done. Have you once thought about who is here? It looks at that, doesn't overlook it, but it takes you to a better place as God reveals himself. It's awesome. Conviction is awesome. Everyone say that. Conviction is awesome. Let's say it again. Fantastic. Have we got that recorded? Good. Okay. So conviction was on God's mind when he began to fill me with joy in his presence. We need to talk, God says, because I want to highlight something in your life that is holding you back from my best for you. We need to talk. Don't leave the mail in the letterbox, family of God. Check it daily and your day will be much better because of it. The second C. Secondly, when God says we need to talk, he wants to address our concerns. And we have concerns. Philippians 4, 6. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. You see those little words, with thanksgiving? You see, if God's been doing a work of conviction in you, and you're receiving the joy of the Lord because we're forgiven, we're children of God, sons and daughters, it's much easier when you're under anxiety or stress about something else that's going on in your life to begin to think about the things that you can be thankful for. And the with thanksgiving is an important part of that verse because it's the key to receiving the peace of God to guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So we can bring the anxiety and we can bring the stress and we can bring the need, but you need to bring it with thanksgiving. And if God's been doing the work of conviction, you will be able to do it you'll know that there are things you can be thankful for. In May this year, at a district leaders' breakfast for our denomination, we had a guest speaker, Scott Stevens. Now, Scott is the ABC's editor and commentator on religion and ethics, a very clever guy, and uh, thinks about things very deeply. At one point, he was talking about how the church engages with the media, and he pointed this out. He told us we're not obliged to answer the questions the media are asking Because the media reflect a culture where people are asking all the wrong questions. It was a great word. You see, sometimes when we think the media want to come to you with, you know, well, what what does your church feel about? What does your church feel about this this issue or that issue? We've got to think about, well, is that the question that needs to be answered right now, or is there another question? And I found the same with God. I found I come to Him with my concerns, and He leads me somewhere else. Seems to have nothing to do with my concerns. I find that the questions I'm asking God are not the questions he's answering. Have you ever found that? Like, God, I I just asked you this. You're telling me something else. It's all connected. It's all connected. But God has this vantage point that we don't have. We we see things on on a level, but when you get high up on a mountain, you can see a whole lot else. But God sees everything. He knows what our life needs. He knows our concerns. Don't get me wrong. And he hears what we're praying. But he, we've got to leave him with the right questions and the right answers to those concerns. When the Apostle John was to receive the Revelation, we now call it the book of Revelation in the Bible, Jesus didn't leave him where he was to receive it. Jesus invited John, come up here and I will show you what is yet to come. And he gave John this revelation of a future when Jesus Christ will return. That's how far John could then see into the future because of Jesus' vantage point. Now, let me tell you what was going on in the church at that time when John wrote that. At the time John wrote Revelation, the church was under extreme persecution. Christians were imprisoned. They were even dying for their faith. They were under pressure to renounce their faith and deny the name of Jesus. There were great hardships requiring great perseverance and false teachings were prolific. You just read the letters to the seven churches and you'll find all of that in there. The church was in a state and everyone and everything was coming against it. Now, in that environment, can you imagine what the concerns of the people were as they prayed to God? They would have been praying for protection. They would have been praying for release. They would have been praying for freedom to live their life, for an end to their enemies. But God answered them by giving them a letter that spoke about the ultimate victory of Christians and the end of the devil. Their situation would not change for centuries. They would still be under persecution. But God gave them something to put their hope in. 
And the church continued not just to exist, but to thrive because of the hope that was set before them that one day all of this will be gone and there'll be no more tears or dying or pain, but Jesus Christ will be all and in all. He gave them a message of hope. It wasn't what they were praying, but God had the vantage point. This is what you need. This is what you need. And if we're willing to let God determine what the real concerns are, then he will, we'll find that he'll give us more than we imagined. When Deb and I uh, were in the, uh, the family stage of having children, I, I had a decent job, but there was never enough money um, for everything that, that was needed at that time. And, um, and so I, just, I brought these concerns to God. And I thought that I'd give God the way of answering the concerns too, because he sort of needs help, doesn't he? We sort of tell him what he should do. And so here's some suggestions, God, of what you could do. So I would pray, God, give me favour with my boss. That was my solution to my problem. Give me favour with my boss. Make him sensitive to my needs. Make him give me a raise. Make him give me a promotion. Make him give me a bonus. And I'd pray this day in and day out. And month after month ended in disappointment because my boss didn't even notice my situation. So when that didn't come through, so I prayed, Lord, help my mum and dad to see our need. They... (laughs) They, they have the means to help us. They have the means to help us. Just a little bit more from them. I wasn't even praying for God's abundance. I was praying for God's just enough. That's where my faith was at the time. Just a little bit more would really help. Lord, open their eyes to our need. And, and, and you know, we'd sort of help them open their eyes too by... Anyway, it doesn't matter. But, but, but God didn't answer this prayer either. Instead, God had other plans for us. We had appliances that never wore out. We had a car that just kept on. It was pretty noisy, but it kept on going. We had these things, and I I still can't today work out how it happened, but our budget showed us $80 in the red every fortnight, and yet we were never out of the black. I don't know how God did that. He just did. Did God let my boss give me a promotion? No. Did he give me a handout from mum and dad? No. But I'll let your stuff go longer. I'll do that for you. How about that? Then you'll trust me every day. See, if I got the bonus, quiet times probably would have dissipated a little bit, you know, my need to pray. Just let that dishwasher go another day. We need to pray that right now, actually. Let that dishwasher go. The resurrection of the dishwasher. You see, without a habit of going to the letterbox, the Bible, each morning and looking for the Word of God that He'd sent to accomplish His purposes, we don't get to hear of God's creative answers to our concerns. He is creative. He thinks of stuff we never think of. And God is creative. And he likes to show us how creative he can be with the concerns that we talk to him about. He wants not only to answer our needs, but also take us up to his vantage point so that we can see as he sees. And you know why? Because he's got more to show us than just our concerns and his answer to them. He's got far more to show us. He's got his plans to show us and his purposes for our lives. He's got that to show us as well. And that's the third thing that God has in his mind when we need to talk. He wants to talk together with us about our calling. He wants to talk about calling. And you know those conversations that you have with your children when they're, when they're just a little son or a little daughter and, and they say, when I grow up, I want to be. You know, you don't, remember those? Or when they're a bit older, maybe in high school, and you're saying to them, so when you leave school, son... What do you want to do? We had those conversations. And, and God has similar things on his mind when he wants to talk with us, but it goes more like this. God says things like, this is what I see in your future. This is the person you're going to become. He doesn't ask us, what do you want to do or what do you want to be? He starts to speak into our lives what he's put there. Since before the creation of the world, he had us in mind. He had our design in mind. He knew what was going to be in us and he knew what would glorify him and he wants to bring it out. So when we come to God daily, we go to the letterbox and we search for his message, one of the things he wants to talk about is his purpose for our lives, his calling over our lives. Colossians 3, 1 to 4 says this, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. And I shared this only a few weeks ago, this principle. If our lives are hidden with Christ, as this scripture asserts, then it makes sense that the more Christ is revealed, the more my life will be revealed. 
The more I get to know Jesus, the more I get to know me because my life is hidden in him. And so if I spend that time daily reading the word and getting to know my Savior more and more, guess what happens? I get a clearer picture of who I am in him. Our lives are hidden in Christ. They're not hidden from us. They're hidden for us to uncover as we daily come to God so that we can talk. And as we do, he talks to us about calling. And calling is not a spiritual word. It's not just pastors and evangelists and preachers. They're not the ones who get called. Everyone has a calling over their life. Everyone has a purpose to fulfill that is in God and that is placed in you. Something that our lives would glorify him with. And everyone is, has a calling to pursue. But you won't walk into it naturally and you won't walk into it by accident. You will walk into it by spending time with God, God and applying what it is that he's telling you. And when you do, when you do, you know that there's something that you're meant to be doing. That's calling. There's just something I'm meant to be doing. Maybe it's just today's calling. Often it's far more than that. Calling is, about, is as much about what God says to you in the journey as it is that when you first realise what it is that he wants you to do to serve him. And it's in this sense that we need to talk. We need to have talk to God times to reveal the next step into his calling. Daily times with God give you course corrections that you'll need to make to stay on the path of his calling. It's like steering a car. I often use this example because it just makes a whole lot of sense to me, but it's like steering a car. You know when you're teaching, uh, when you're learning to drive, you're not conscious sometimes that you're veering to the left or to the right, and often it's the instructor or your parent that says, oh, you need to correct that, you're veering, and, and it has to be a, like a more of a drastic correction. But have you noticed that over time and more hours in the car and as you get more experience on the road that you're not veering to the left or to the right anymore? It's actually not true. You still are. You still veer to the left and to the right. But now that you have experience and now that your, your brain is, is talking to your steering hands a, a little bit more clearly, what you're not noticing are the minor adjustments that you're making all the time. You see road camber, wind, tyre wear, speed, a road surface, all of those things can, make, uh, can impact you driving straight. And so we're always making little corrections. We don't even know we're doing it because our brain is unconsciously telling our hands. And so we never have these drastic movements off course. That's a daily quiet time with God. You don't even know it, but you're getting course corrections all the time into the purposes and the plans of God. A little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there. You don't even know until a year down the track you think, and you look back and think, man, oh man, I am in a different place as a person. That's because you're making the course corrections. But if you sort of leave quiet times and let that slide and come back to it after a month, you find, oh, there's a big correction to make, big correction in my life. I veered off. It doesn't need to be that way. When it comes to time talking with God, if you do it daily and regularly, only those minor adjustments are necessary. And if you spend long periods of time away from those daily quiet times, you'll find the adjustments are more pronounced. I'll get the musicians to come back. Conviction, concerns, and calling. God will speak to you persistently in those three areas as you come to him. His word, the Bible, is like your letterbox where God has deposited mail for each new day and his letters are for your future. They're for your good. They're for your joy. That's how he treats sons and daughters. He speaks to you about possibilities. Don't let the mail back up. It is the best mail you'll get.